Om Swastiastu. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. I, I am Rika Juniorika. Next to me is Vanessa. We will host the seminar today. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to extend my warm welcome to distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for giving your honor presence to a seminar, Emergence de l'identité Baline Aleppo Colonial, Agama, Adat, Budaya by Misha Picard, and Identitas Orang Bali Contemporary by Jean Couto, which organized by AF Bali in cooperation with Bentara Budaya Bali. Bapak, Ibu, dan hadirin, atas nama penyelenggara, kami ingin menyampaikan salam hangat kepada para tamu dan hadirin yang terhormat pada seminar identitas orang Bali yang akan dipresentasikan oleh antropolog Michelle Picard dan juga budayawan Bapak Jong Koto yang diorganis oleh Pusat Kebudayaan Perancis Alion France Bali bekerja sama dengan Bentara Budaya Bali. This thing is guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we start, we'd like to inform you that after the seminar, we will have uh, art video screening and uh, poetry reading by Theater Kalangan and DJ from Sound Sekerta. Bapak, Ibu, dan hadirin sekalian, selain seminar pada sore hari ini, Malam ini juga akan dimaknai dengan sejumlah program, yakni ada pemutaran art video yang mengadaptasi puisi-puisi dari penyair Jolom Apoliner, kemudian juga ada pembacaan puisi oleh Teater Kalangan dan DJ Sons Karta yang tentunya bisa menutup kebersamaan kita malam ini dengan indah. And to begin with, we would like to invite Amanding Salmon, Directress of AF Bali, to deliver her open remark. Please welcome Amandine. Mari kita sambut Amandine Salmon, direktris dari Alion France Bali untuk menyampaikan sambutan. Mohon beri tepuk tangan. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, welcome to Bentara Budaya for the ending day of Francophonie Week, the international celebration of the diversity of those who speak French around the world. This year for Francophonie, Alliance Française Bali has been proud to provide a variety of events and activities to acknowledge this dynamic and beautiful language, as well as the global dynamic nature of those who speak it. On Wednesday night, this week, we screened the French movie Last night, we held a theater play in Alliance Française Bali. In spite of the rain, I'm very glad that many people came to watch the film and the theater play. I am delighted to see so many of you here tonight at Bentara Budaya Bali. Alliance Française has been cooperating with Bentara for many years now, and it's always a pleasure to see this place, always full of wonderful people. To conclude, I, I should like to quote a few figures for you to measure the presence and the vitality of Francophonie around the world. French is a vibrant and dynamic language community shared by some 274 million speakers throughout the world. And I am sure that many of you tonight are part of this huge community. French is spoken on five continents and is the second most learned language after English. At last but not least, I would like to underline the fact that, that even if our two countries, Indonesia and France, are far away from each other, every year 550 students go to France for their studies. Among her alumni, France has some important Indonesian figures, such as Yusuf Kala, Andrea Irata, and Raden Saleh. And finally, a significant number of French researchers work closely with Indonesian researchers on science and on humans and social science subjects. Tonight, we are very pleased to welcome two major figures of the Franco-Indonesian cooperation, Professor Jean Couteau and Professor Michel Picard. I would like to thank our guests, Michel and Jean, 
for sharing with us their knowledge. Also, many thanks to Bentara Budaya, French Institute in Jakarta, French Embassy. Thank you, Pawari, and all team of Bentara Budaya and Alliance Francaise, without whom all this wouldn't be possible. Thank you, public, for your kind support. Have a wonderful afternoon and evening. Thank you. Now we will introduce our speakers. Michel Picard, an anthropologist, to deliver a presentation about emergence de l'identité baliné à l'époque coloniale agama adat budaya. And Jean Couteau, to deliver identitas orang Bali contemporary. And we have Ayu Dia Cempaka as the moderator. Hadirin, mohon beri applause untuk para narasumber dan moderator yang sudah tampil di depan. Presentasi dari Bapak Michel Picard, Bapak Jean Koto, dan akan dipandu oleh Ayu Diah Cempaka. Uh, cek. Selamat sore kawan-kawan, selamat datang di Bentara Budaya Bali. So, good afternoon everyone, welcome to Bentara Budaya Bali. Uh, jadi kita akan memulai diskusi pada sore hari ini, sebagaimana yang tadi MC sudah sebutkan pada sore hari, hari ini kita kedatangan dua pembicara ada Michelle Picard di sebelah kiri saya dan juga ada Jean Kuto di sebelah kanan saya yang pada sore hari ini akan membicarakan mengenai identitas orang Bali di era kolonial dan juga identitas orang Bali kontemporer uh, sebelumnya izinkan saya memperkenalkan kedua pembicara kita pada sore hari ini di sebelah kiri saya ada Michelle Picard Michel Picard adalah seorang peneliti yang pernah menjadi bagian dari Pusat Penelitian Saintifik Nasional SNRS dan anggota pendiri Songtrasi du Sudes di Paris yang lahir pada tahun 1946. Michel Picard memperoleh gelar PhD dari Ecole des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales pada tahun 1984. Penelitian Michel Picard berfokus pada implikasi pariwisata internasional bagi masyarakat lokal dan lebih khususnya lagi bagi konstruksi identitas Bali dalam hal budaya, tradisi, dan juga agama. Selain menulis banyak artikel tentang permasalahan ini, ia juga banyak menulis tentang Bali lainnya, misalnya seperti konstruksi dialog mengenai identitas Bali pada tahun 2017, kemudian ada Bali, Cultural Tourism and Touristic Culture yang sudah diterjemahkan ke dalam bahasa Indonesia menjadi pariwisata budaya dan budaya pariwisata. Yang mungkin teman-teman sudah familiar dengan bukunya karena sudah banyak beredar di Indonesia. Uh, kemudian pembicara kita yang kedua di sebelah kanan saya ada Bapak Jean Kuto. Bapak Jean Kuto merupakan budayawan, penulis sekaligus pengamat seni asal Perancis. Beliau memperoleh gelar Master Sosiologi dari Universitas Sorbonne, Prancis dan gelar Doktor dari EHES dengan disertasi mengenai ikonografi gambar Bali. Bapak Jung Kuto telah menulis lebih dari 15 judul buku dalam bahasa Indonesia, bahasa Inggris, dan juga bahasa Prancis. Beberapa di antaranya adalah Bali Today, catatan-catatan kebudayaan dalam dua edisi. Ada juga buku tentang pelukis Avandi, buku mengenai Sri Hadi Sudarsono, Puri Lukisan, dan lain sebagainya. Bapak Jung Kuto juga banyak menulis ulasan seni di media Indonesia. Dan pada sore hari ini, presentasi akan dimulai oleh uh, Michelle Picard dalam bahasa Inggris. So everyone, the, the discussion uh, this afternoon will be held in English and also in Indonesia by Jung Kuto. So I will try to translate in both languages, but I would like to apologize for the French guests that we don't have presentation in French, but maybe after we can discuss in French. <laughs> so for the first presentation, uh, I would like to invite Monsieur Michel Picard. Yeah, Prima Gassé. Uh, Rajang Sore. So the, the island of Bali 
was one of the last regions of Indonesia to be subjugated by the Dutch. Its conquest was launched in 1846 and only completed in 1908. Yet, long before colonial administrators set about dealing with Balinese society, it had been imagined by Orientalists as a leading museum of Indo-Javanese civilization, the only surviving heir to the Hindu heritage of Madhupahit, swept away from Java by the coming of Islam. Because Dutch officials held Hinduism to be the core of Balinese identity, they set out to turn Bali into a stronghold of Hinduism to counter the expansion of Islam throughout the archipelago. By thus looking for the singularity of Bali in its Hindu heritage and seeing Balinese identity as formed through an opposition to Islam, the Dutch established the frame of reference within which the Balinese would later on define themselves. Although the Dutch wanted to insulate Balinese society from disturbing foreign influences, Bali actually underwent drastic changes as a result of interference in native affairs by the colonial state. In particular, the requirements of a modern administration prompted the formation of a Balinese intelligentsia, Kaum Torpolajar, since the colonial state needed educated natives to mediate between the local population and the foreign masters. The disruption caused by the occupation of the island compelled the first generation of Balinese educated in colonial schools to engage in a process of self-identification. In Singaraja, the seat of the colonial government on the north coast of the island, these Dutch-educated Balinese set up modern organizations and started publishing periodicals, a complete novelty for Bali. Devoted chiefly to social and religious issues, these publications were written not in Balinese, but in Malay, the language of Islam, as well as of colonial modernity. Thus, the same process which led the Balinese to question their identity was depriving them of their own words by making them think about themselves in a language which was not their own, but that used both by the fellow countrymen and by their colonial rulers. The first of these organizations, Sotiti Bali, was founded in 1917 by Igusti Bagus Chakratnaya, a Pungawa, what would be known as Chamat, to counter the Javanese Islamic Association Sarekat Islam, which had recently opened the branch in Singaraja. Sotiti Bali lasted until 1920 and was succeeded by an organization called Sueta Gamatirta established by Iketut Nasser, the head of a primary school, and presided over by Igusti Putujalantik, a descendant of the Raja of Buleleng. In 1923, these three influential figures set up the Santi Association, and in January 1924, they started publishing a periodical called Santi Adnyana. All these organizations had been open to both the nobility, the Trewangsa, and to commoners, the Jabba. But tension was rife between the two groups, with the Jabba objecting to various privileges claimed by the Trewangsa. A conflict soon arose between the leaders of each faction, Chakratnaya and Kututnasa. Chakratnaya took over the publication of Santi Adnyana, and change its name to Bali Adnyana. The conflict escalated until a split between Jabba and Triwangsa became inevitable. In October 1925, 
Qutut Nasser started publishing his own periodical, Surya Kanta. And the following month, he set up the Surya Kanta Association, whose membership was restricted to the Jabal. The situation became more confused after May 1926, <clears throat> with the founding of an organization named Chatur Wangsa Dhrir Gama Hindu Bali, which was controlled by Tri Wangsa and used Bali Adnyana as its mouthpiece. The few authors who have commented on these organizations tended to stress the conflict opposing the commoners to the nobility, a conflict they analyzed as a contest between the forces of progress and those of reaction. It's true that a substantial part of the debate between Suryakanta and Baliadnyana concerned the Triwangsa's privileges, which had grown under the colonial policy and which the Jabba wanted to abolish in the name of progress, the Majuan. <coughs> Yet, by focusing on the so-called caste conflict, per tantang and casta, one misses the fact that, even if they held opposite positions on many issues, Jabba and Triwangsa shared a similar vision of Balinese identity. The aim of Surya Kanta was to raise the standing of the Jabal in Balinese society and to defend their rights. Most of its members were young school teachers and minor officials for whom colonial education had been a means of social mobility. They took up their mission to enlighten the Balinese people and prepare them for the advent of modern times, Jaman Moderan. The goals of Surya Kanta were thus formulated in the statutes of the organization. First, to foster reason, Mangutamakanbudi. Second, to improve the economy, Mamparabaiki economy. Third, to improve the fate of the commoners, Mamparabaiki Nasib Kaum Jabba. And fourth, to change the customs that were contrary to the progress of the times. The means to these ends was Western-style education, Pandidikan Charabarat, seen as the foundation of progress. Thanks to the enlightenment acquired by their education, the Balinese would know which of the customs they should conserve and which they should reform in accordance with the progress of the world, Kamajuan Dunya. In Soya Kanta's view, the main obstacle to progress in Bali was caste prejudice and the privileges enjoyed by the Triwangsa. This was no longer acceptable for the Jabba, who demanded the same position in society as the Triwangsa, equality and solidarity, Samarata Samarasa. Thanks to their education, the Jabba would raise the social status and be paid due respect by the Triwangsa. In other words, status in Balinese society should no longer be inherited but achieved. It should stem from merit and not from birth. Faced with such criticism, the Triwangsa attempted to defend the position as best as they could. To begin with, Chakratanaya accused his opponents of being motivated by envy in the foolish pursuit to abolish the caste system, system casta. By challenging the nobility, he claimed, the commoners were dividing the Balinese people and creating dissent among them. Then, Chakratanaya launched scathing attacks against the so-called progress pursued by Surya Kanta. For him, far from improving the situation of the Balinese people, such a passion for progress, Hawanafsu Maju, would only bring misery to Bali. Yet, 
Chakratamaya claimed to be a true advocate of progress. But his idea of progress was the one which had prevailed in the past when the aim was to fill one's mind. Komajuan Charadulu, Adala Komajuan, on Tukmangisi Pikir. And not as it was in the present, when it was only a matter of filling one's stomach. Komajuan Charaskarang, Adala Komajuan, on Tukmanchari Isi Purut. Progress is welcome, he said, as long as it does not approve the Balinese from their identity. Progress should not be forced upon the Balinese, the vast majority of whom were still ignorant, Masibodo. But it should be the result of an evolution, evolusi, rather than of a revolution, revolusi. However, beyond the dispute between Soyakamta and Balianyana, Jabo and Triwangso shared a common concern with the Balinese identity and were eager to preserve its foundations. In particular, both publications alike denounced Islamic proselytism in Bali and were concerned about the conversions of Balinese to Islam. It is in these publications that, for the first time, the Balinese began viewing themselves as a people, Kita, Bangsa, Bali. Until then, Balinese identified as members of a village community, a kinship group, or a temple congregation, rather than as Balinese. The collective identity took shape during the colonial period, when they attempted to define themselves as distinct not only from the foreign colonizers, but also from the other peoples in the Indies. In these publications, the Balinese presented themselves both as an ethnic group characterized by their own customs and as a religious community threatened by the expansion of Islam. Specifically, they defined their identity, which they called their Balinese-ness, Ke Balian, as being based on Agama and on Adat, Ke Balian Kita, Burdasa, Agama Dan Adat. But far from expressing a primordial essence, as they claimed, these categories were alien and had to be appropriated by the Balinese according to their own references. While today the word agama is translated as religion in Indonesia, one should know that it did not always have that meaning. In Sanskrit, agama signifies that which has come down to the present, and it applies to anything handed down as fixed by tradition. Although it is difficult to establish when the word agama came to mean religion in Indonesia, we know that in Javanese and Balinese textual traditions, it applied, it applied to law codes related to the Indian Dharmashastra, the treatises on Dharma, in which legal and religious features are not distinguished. We also know that from the 14th century onward, in Malay chronicles, Agama became associated with Islam and used in the sense of Din. Therefore, one has to conclude that for centuries, the word Agama in Indonesia had two distinct denotations, that of Dharma, as well as that of Din, according to its context. By taking over the term Agama, Indonesian Muslims endowed it with new meaning, namely, the exclusive worship of the one and only God and the requirement of conversion to a foreign doctrine whose teachings are contained in a holy book revealed by a prophet. As a result, a sharp distinction was drawn between infidels and true believers. By taking on the meaning of religion, Agama was not only being dissociated from law, but also from tradition, which in Indonesia is rendered by the Arabic loanword adat. 
In the same fashion as Dharma, Adat refers to the cosmic order and to social life in agreement with that order. This comprehensive scope of Adat was reduced by Islam, which confined its significance to customs that do not have a religious legitimation. In particular, the word Adat entered the language of Islamized populations to refer to indigenous customary law as opposed to Islamic religious law, hukum, taken over by the Balinese. The word Adat replaced a diverse terminology for local customs, which governed the relationships between social groups and sanctioned communal solidarity in the villages. The incorporation of local customs into this generic term changed the meaning for the Balinese. What had been an interplay of significant differences deliberately fosters between villages became the locus of Balinese ethnic identity in the sense of a customary body of norms and institutions inherited by the Balinese people. As such, in Bali, Adat was not distinguished from Agama. Unlike the world religions that have a core of basic principles, meaningful to peoples of diverse cultural backgrounds, Balinese ritual life is localized, connecting specific groups of people to one another, their ancestors, and their territory. It consists in a series of transactions with the invisible world, the Niskala, in which human beings present offerings and worship in exchange for blessings of holy water that ensure the, re the renewal of life and the regeneration of nature. Participation in these rites is a, is a customary obligation for the Balinese, which sanctions membership in a village community, a kinship group, and a temple congregation. Rather than something to be believed in, Balinese ritual life is something to be carried out. We don't know when Balinese started using the word agama in the sense of religion. However, we know that in Bali the word agama retained its original polysemy, as we find in Balinese Indonesian dictionaries, which translate agama as first agama, second hukum, and third adat. We also know that agama still had the meaning of dharma in Bali throughout the colonial period. It is significant, for example, that in the catalog designed by Balinese scholars for the Kirtia Library, set up in 1928 by the Dutch administration to preserve Balinese manuscripts, the entry agama refers not to religion, but to law codes related to the Dharma Shastra. There is no entry corresponding to the category religion. We don't know either when Balinese actually chose to designate their own agama as Hindu. But we do know that long before they defined themselves as Hindus, the Balinese had already been identified as Hindus by Orientalists at a time when they had yet to learn the word Hinduism. And we know further that it is through the works of Dutch Orientalists that educated Balinese elites acquire the first information of, on Hinduism in the 20th century. <clears throat> While both Jabu and Triwangsa shared a common reference to Agama and Adat as the foundation of Kabbalion, they held different opinions as to how Agama is connected with Adat on the one hand, and how Balinese religion is related to Indian Hinduism on the other. And it is this difference, as much as the more visible caste conflict, which explains the split between Jabu and Triwangsa. While the Triwangsa were determined to strengthen both tradition and religion, Manugukan Agama Pardon. Manugukan Adat Danagama, the Jabba wanted to reform Agama, 
was clean while cleansing Adat of all the customs they deemed incompatible with the will of the times. Menuguka Nagama dan Meroba Adat Yong Bortan Tangam Dengan Kamawan Jaman. Thus, for the Triwangsa, Balinese religion was based on tradition, Agamakita Bangsa Bali Berdasa Adat, from which it could not be separated. Adat Danagama Dabole Borcharaya. Whereas for the Jabba, religion should be dissociated from a traditional order seen as an impediment to progress. Yet, they proved unable to differentiate between that which pertains to Adat and that which belongs to Agama. Kita tidatau membedakan yang mana Adat dan mana Agama. The inability of the Balinese to dissociate Agama from Adat did not stem only from the polysemy of these terms, but also from the fact that up until then, they had yet to single out a system of beliefs and practices that could be demarcated from other aspects of the life and labeled religion. As it happens, Agama could not become a boundary marker for the Balinese before they began to view Islam as a threat. While Muslim communities which had been living on the island for generations had long been integrated within the indigenous social and cosmic order, by the 1920s, Balinese leaders had come, had come to resent the increasing conversions of their co-religionists to Islam. However, for them, Islam was seen not only as a threat, but also as a model of what a true religion should be. In this respect, one should pay attention to the controversy that has divided the Balinese over the proper name of their religion. This proved to be a highly contentious issue, which triggered a protracted conflict between those Balinese who wished to retain their local traditions and those who wanted to reform them in accordance with what they assumed Hinduism was about. In the past, the Balinese had no generic name for that which would later on become their religion. Once they had adopted the word Agama for that purpose, they referred to the religion simply as Agama Bali. Afterwards, Balinese started using various names for the religion, such as Agama Tirta, Agama Shiwa, Agama Buddha, Agama Shiwa Buddha, and later on Agama Hindu. In 1925, a dispute arose between commoners and the nobility over the name of the Balinese religion. The Triwangsa proposed to call the religion Agama Hindu Bali, stressing the fact that the Balinese had appropriated Agama Hindu to such an extent that it had become indigenous to their island. In this way, they were clearly trying to preserve the customary order by endorsing the religion actually practiced by the Balinese. The Jabba, on the other hand, proposed the name Agama Bali Hindu, which they defended by claiming that the Balinese were truly Hindus, even in the, if their religious practices were corrupt due to their ignorance of the real nature of their religion. Consequently, in order to become the true Hindus they were supposed to be, the Balinese should discard all the local customs that contaminated the religious practices. Hence, the Triwangsa accused the Jabba of promoting a form of Hinduism similar to that found in India. This, they said, 
amounted to inventing a new religion, which was alien to the Balinese, because the religion originated not from India, but from Madhrapahit. It was therefore the duty of the Balinese to remain faithful to the religion their ancestors had brought to Bali when they were fleeing the propagation of Islam in Java after the fall of Madhrapahit. The tension between Jabba and Triwangsa receded in 1928, thanks to the combined efforts of leading Balinese aristocrats and Dutch officials who worked hard to diffuse what they saw as a political threat. The way to diffuse that threat was to culturalize Balinese identity. This was the aim of the colonial policy known as Balinization, Balisering which was expected to promote a renaissance of Balinese culture. Designed by Dutch Orientalists, this policy was specifically intended from native youth with the aim of making them conscious of the value of their cultural heritage by means of an education focusing on Balinese language, literature, and the arts. Now, culture and art are specific topics had so far been absent from Balinese reflections on their identity. In fact, just as the Balinese language has no term for religion or tradition, it also has known for culture or art. Yet, one begins to encounter occasional references to these topics in the 1920s. Thus, in Bali Adnyana, the term Puradaban Bali tended to become a substitute for Kabbalian. On the other hand, in Soya Kanta, one sometimes found the Dutch word kultur, while art was occasionally rendered by the Dutch term kunst. In 1930, the Kirtia launched the publication of the journal Bawanagar, with the financial support of the colonial state. The articles published in Bawanagara were markedly different from those in Soryakanta and Baliadnyana. To begin with, a significant portion were in Balinese, as the Dutch had a political interest in fostering the consciousness of a Balinese cultural identity as opposed to an identity based on national unity. On the agenda was Balinese culture, as specified in Bawanagara's motto, a monthly newsletter dedicated to Balinese culture. Surat Bulanan Untung Mamperatikan Peradaban Bali. This interest in Balinese culture was taken up in the journal Jatayu, published by a new organization formed in 1936, Bali Laksana, whose statutes aimed at enhancing the progress of Balinese culture. Mampertingi Kemajuan Kebudayan Bali. Thus, if the word for religion had been borrowed from Sanskrit and that for tradition from Arabic, the notions of culture and art were initially acquired from Dutch before being appropriated from Malay. Bawanagara's motto referred to per adaban, and one finds both the term culture and per adaban in its articles. In Jatayu, these terms tended to be replaced with Kabudayam, a neologism of Sanskrit origin whose root Budaya pointed to the development of the character of an individual before taking on the meaning of culture. As for Kusinian, which tended to replace the word Kunst, its root, Suni, meant refine before becoming understood in the sense of art. At the same time that Dutch Orientalist and Balinese intellectuals were culturalizing Bali, the island's cultural image was being promoted by the development of tourism. Along with tourists, the artists and scholars who lived in Bali between the wars popularized the spectacular artistry of Balinese ceremonies. 
the written accounts, paintings, photographs, and films, which recorded our journey to the island, created a fabulous image of native life, an image which would be sprayed in due time by the promotional services of the tourism industry. Not only did they disseminate the image of Bali as a tourist paradise, but they identified Balinese society with its culture, which they viewed mostly in terms of its artistic and ritual manifestations. The Balinese intelligentsia appear to have been aware early on of this new fame of their island, to which they reacted in contrasting ways. The first references to tourism I was able to locate in Soriakanta were frankly negative. Thus, the author of an article titled Bali Sebage Museum Baran Kuno reproached the Balinese people for being seduced by the glamour of their island. They rejected the image of a living museum, Museum Hedup, propagated by Orientalists, and denounced the policy of cultural preservation conducted by the colonial government. As zealots of progress, the Jabba wanted Bali to shake off its archaic reputation and become a modern society with nothing about it to arouse the curiosity of tourists in search of the exotic. As could be expected, such a critical stance would find no place in Bali Adnyana, and even less so in Bawanagar. Indeed, the first writing by Balinese about their arts in this journal took obvious pride in evoking the artistic reputation of their island. Thus, an article on Balinese music, after having quoted an, a Dutch author expressing the widespread opinion that every Balinese is an artist, opened with the following statement. Bagitula, manda patanoranga sing, kita bangsa Bali, suatu bangsa ya manchita seni, behakla kita mambasarkan hati, tentang sifat kebangsaan kita sebagai torsebo di atas. While in the 1920s, the context of Balinese debate had remained essentially Balinese, during the 1930s, it was becoming increasingly Indonesian. In particular, the questions regarding Balinese religion were re-emerging, more pressing than ever, in Jatayu. By then, the Balinese were clearly on the defensive as the controversy was no longer only due to disagreement among themselves, but to the fact that they did not know how to reply to accusations of idolatry, not only by Indonesian Muslims, but also by Christian missionaries who had recently been allowed to settle on their island. Faced with such a negative opinion, the Balinese reformers were intent on seeking an agreement on the true nature of the religion and on codifying its right accordingly. Thus, during the first Congress held in 1937, the leaders of Bali Dharma Laksana commissioned a committee of priests to compile a holy book, Kitatsuchi, which would represent for the Balinese what the Koran is to Muslims. They assumed that once the Balinese knew what the religion was actually about, they would be in a better position to defend it against Muslims and Christians alike, and would thus be less tempted to embrace another faith. Unfortunately, three years later, the readers of Jatayu were informed that the attempt at composing a Kitab Suchi had failed. The reason given was that in Bali, Agama could not be divorced from Adat, and Adat deferred from one village to the next. Hence, the members of the committee could not agree on a religious canon valid for the whole island. After the integration of the island into the Indonesian state, 
The Balinese were compelled to discriminate between Agama and Adat so that the religion would be acknowledged as legitimate by the commentary on Agama. In the process, Balinese Adat had to give up its former religious authority while some of its aspects were singled out for the artistic qualities and relocated to the domain of Budaya or Sunni Budaya. Later on, when the new order became involved in promoting tourism and expressed an interest in regional cultures, Balinese culture was requested to contribute both to the development of international tourism in Indonesia and to the fostering of Indonesian national culture. Eventually, with their Adat secularized and their Budaya touristified, Agama Hindu has become the distinctive marker of Kabbalian. But this is another story which I'm not going to address now. So, Sukyan dan terima kasih. Uh, okay, thank you for uh, Monsieur Michel Picard for the long yet very interesting explanation about the construction of Balinese identity in the colonial era, agama, adat, budaya. Uh, jadi itu tadi satu presentasi yang panjang namun sangat menarik dari uh, Michel Picard mengenai konstruksi identitas Bali di era kolonial mengenai adat agama dan budaya. Teman-teman tadi bisa lihat presentasi yang sudah terpapar di belakang, tapi mungkin saya akan sarikan sedikit, uh, saya akan resume semua presentasi tadi dalam satu paragraf uh, kecil. Jadi penjelasan tadi dimulai dari bagaimana para intelektual Bali atau masyarakat Bali yang terdidik di bawah penjajah Belanda kemudian membuat sebuah perkumpulan untuk kemudian merilis publikasi-publikasi intelektual, yang dimana publikasi-publikasi ini beberapa diantaranya adalah uh, Stiti Bali, kemudian ada Bali Adnyana, dan kemudian ada Surya Kanta, uh, yang mana mereka mengalami konflik internal mengenai posisi Triwangsa dan juga kaum Jaba. Kaum Jaba, uh, jadi Triwangsa teman-teman tahu sendiri, uh, dan kemudian ada uh, pihak Jaba yang memiliki cara pandang yang ternyata berbeda atau bertentangan gitu mengenai melihat posisi Bali itu sendiri. Jadi kalau misalnya di sini ditulis oleh Michel Picard, tujuan dari media Surya Kanta, mereka membuat media namanya Surya Kanta, itu adalah untuk memberikan posisi pada kaum Jaba, kaum Jaba, orang-orang Jaba di dalam masyarakat Bali itu sendiri, yang ke, yang kemudian mereka ingin mengakhiri Western style education. Jadi pendidikan ala barat dan menemukan jati diri mereka sebagai orang Bali. Kemudian Surya Kanta eh, yang diusung oleh kelompok Jaba ini merasa bahwa hambatan mereka adalah privilege dari kaum Triwangsa, keistimewaan yang diperoleh oleh, oleh para kaum Triwangsa. Jadi sistem kasta itu merupakan hambatan di dalam masyarakat Bali modern yang kemudian itu e, berbeda tujuannya dengan Bali Adnyana itu sendiri. E, nah terlepas dari pertentangan antara Surya Kanta dan Bali Adnyana, di kedua media inilah pertama kalinya masyarakat Bali mendik, mendeklarasikan diri sebagai sebuah masyarakat, sebuah society, people, yaitu kaum Bali itu sendiri, karena sebelumnya mereka hanya dilihat berdasarkan e, etnis Bali, berdasarkan apa yang didefinisikan oleh para penjajah Belanda. Yang kemudian um, Michel Picard menjelaskan mengenai pemahaman soal agama dan adat itu sendiri. Jadi agama dan ad, agama itu sendiri sebenarnya tidak pernah ada dalam bahasa Indonesia. Oh ya saya lupa tadi publikasi mereka yang pertama Surya Kanta dan Bali Adnyana dicetak dalam bahasa Melayu, bukan dalam bahasa Bali. Sehingga mereka mengalami krisis identitas, orang-orang Bali terdidik ini merasa mereka bingung mereka ini siapa karena tidak menggunakan bahasa Bali. Kemudian soal agama ini, karena di Bali sendiri 
agama dan adat adalah satu kesatuan. Praktik agama dan praktik adat dahulunya merupakan sebuah kesatuan yang tidak bisa dipisahkan. Kedua-duanya punya fungsi untuk mengatur e, baik itu tatanan masyarakat maupun bagaimana mereka melakukan pemujaan terhadap Tuhan. Namun dalam bahasa Indonesia itu menjadi berbeda ketika diterjemahkan jadi agama dan adat. Seolah-olah agama adalah sesuatu yang hanya berbau religius dan adat hanyalah sesuatu yang mengatur e, tatanan hidup masyarakat itu. Sementara itu sangat berbeda di Bali itu sendiri. Um, Oke, okay, oh, jadi udah. Mungkin di sini ada uh, beberapa bagian lagi soal konflik antara Triwangsa dan Jabe. Jadi uh, Triwangsa merasa bahwa tujuan mereka, tujuan agama Hindu itu adalah untuk meneguhkan adat dan agama. E, sementara untuk kaum Jabe, mereka memiliki pandangan yang lebih progresif, yaitu meneguhkan agama dan mengubah adat yang bertentangan dengan kemajuan zaman. Jadi mereka selalu menuntut kemajuan zaman dalam mendefinisikan agama. E, yang kemudian di masa itu mereka sama-sama melihat e, kedatangan agama Islam sebagai sebuah ancaman di Bali, yang itu sedikit banyaknya membantu mereka untuk bersatu. Oke, okay. dan tadi di terakhir uh, kita melihat bahwa pertentangan antara kaum Jabe dan Triwangsa ini mulai mereda ketika penjajah Belanda kemudian masuk dan mengintervensi masyarakat Bali dengan mendeklarasikan sebuah pemahaman budaya untuk membangun kembali budaya Bali itu sendiri yang itu digunakan untuk kepentingan pariwisata yang responnya juga jauh berbeda yaitu dari kau dari Surya Kanta di media Surya Kanta mereka menolak image dari Living Museum mereka menolak e, disebut sebagai museum hidup mereka menolak untuk dilabeli oleh kaum penjajah sementara satunya lagi di Bali Adnyana mereka justru bangga dengan label yang diberikan oleh penjajah Belanda ini yang itu berlanjut kemudian ke setelah Indonesia merdeka, agama Hindu memiliki merasa memiliki sebuah keharusan untuk memiliki kitab suci. Karena itu adalah syarat untuk diakui sebagai salah satu agama yang resmi di Indonesia. Namun sayangnya itu banyak ditentang karena praktik dari beragama itu sendiri di Bali berbeda-beda. Jadi tidak ada satu kesatuan soal praktik beragama. Dan itu berlanjut hingga masa Orde Baru, di mana Orde Baru kemudian kembali mendeklarasikan kebudayaan untuk kepentingan pariwisata Bali. Oke, okay. itu kurang lebih uh, presentasi dari Michelle Picard. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Michelle Picard, for the presentation. Uh, so now we will continue this presentation with uh, Bapak Jong Kuto mengenai identitas masyarakat Bali kontemporer. Saya lebih suka berdiri, lebih mudah bernapas. Ya. Ya. And since we have a few guests you see coming from abroad, I will have to carry on in English. Yeah. But at a later stage, perhaps we are going to use Indonesian. Yeah. And I will begin with Indonesian. Apa yang kita pelajari dari Makala Michel Picard ialah bahwa konseptualisasi identitas ditentukan oleh faktor politik. Orang Bali merumuskan diri berdasarkan ruang yang diberikan oleh penjajah. I say the Balinese have conceptualized their identity through political constraints. They have named their identity within the space given to them by colonials, by the Dutch. Yeah. And now, I take as a given fact that religion is accepted as 
Hindu by the elites here. And I will try to explain shortly how you see this Hindu identity sociologically minor became, I would say, an obsession of today. Also because of political determinations. Yeah. So let's start with the independence of Indonesia. When Indonesia became independence, identity was something given, except for a small elite. It didn't have to be, to be expressed. It wasn't the topic of a discourse in the kampung. And this changed with times. As long as Sukarno was president of Indonesia, there was a symbiosis between the way the Balinese saw themselves as Balinese and as Indonesians. Local identity, Balinese identity was minor. It wasn't strongly affirmed as such. But things came to change with the fall of the uh, Ordo Lama. Why? Because during the Ordo Lama, the emphasis was on social justice to the extreme about Professor uh, Adnyane Manuaboy. He went back to the, uh, to the uh, School of Medicine. So big capital was free to do what it wanted to do with Balinese tourism. And of course, we saw and we still see the consequences. How could the Balinese react against this takeover by outside capital over their own island? Yeah. Again, by focusing on tradition, focusing on religion. Religion became the main way to protest against the takeover of the island by outside capital. When you had hotels being built in Tanalot, people didn't protest against capital. People didn't protest in the name of social justice. They protested against the takeover of Jakarta's capital on Bali. Of course, if you have religion becoming, you see, the means to protest the economic takeover of an island, you end up having a focus, an increased focus on religion. Considering that at the same time, similar things happened in other parts of Indonesia, where all religions are on an equal footing, you see. 
So, also, social discontent in other parts of Indonesia also was channeled through, yeah, through religion again. And it's where the game is becoming, in my eyes, is becoming dangerous. Because religious identity spurred by the wrong kind of politic. Using this is the facilities of, of Panchasila might well pit Indonesians against one another. And it's where we come to another factor. Of course, when you have economic development, you need labor. And where do you get cheap labor? The Balinese are not good workers. They can be good workers, but they are not easy workers because they want to go to their village whenever there are ceremonies. And all of them, they have their piece of land. So they are to reach quotation, uh, uh, quotation marks. They are to reach to be easily manipulated workers. Whereas in Java, you have millions of people who have no place to be. So that's cheap labor. So in the 80s, what did you see? A big influx of uh, outside workers into Bali. At the same time as you have, as, as you, have you see uh, people reacting against the takeover of the island by outside capital, you have a migration phenomenon. Of course, you have focus on ethnic, religious identity, especially if you have big transformations in the ethnic balance of the island. And this carries on until now. Of course, the Balinese, they become urbanized. They go to school. So if they urbanize, it means they do not worship the way they used to worship in their tradition because they live in the city. So you have changes in the way religion sociologically functions. Okay, so you have all tendencies toward the focalization of identity around religion. All the more so as land has become a commodity which is sometimes giving the Balinese the appearance of prosperity because they sell their land. So what did we see? For example, I'll give you a last example. What did we see until a few months ago, until last year? You had a huge project which was going to take place in Benoit Reclamacy, the Reclamacy project. Of course, in normal situations, such a project was foreseen to create 200,000 jobs. Good 200 thousand jobs. Yeah. But again, the owners, the capital, was going to come from outside. 
and the local labor market only could provide 30 or 40,000 jobs. So it would have meant a huge inflow of alien workers into the island. Yeah. But the Balinese, they didn't react in the name of ethnicity, and they are right because they still, they don't focus in, uh, in whatever the mistakes of the, of the economic policies. We have no real ethnic tensions in Bali because the Balinese are Balinese and because the Indonesians are Indonesian. We do not have this tradition, but the economic policies are going in the wrong direction, you see. Of course, investment can unite the country. But when you invest, you have to take into account, you see, the social balance of the place. Yeah. So in Nusa Dua, in, uh, in Benoit, what did we see? Of course, some fellows pretended to protest in the name of ecology. Yeah. Other ones in the name of social justice. Yeah. But what did they do? They turned, you see, the whole area into a sacred place. So their way to protest was again to use religion as an instrument of protest, which means again a new focalization on religious identity. Whereas actually in older times, when I first came to Bali, you had many sacred places in, uh, uh, in uh, Benoit. But this temple was sacred with 50 people around here. That temple with 100 or 200, it was not sacred as a unit. So what we see is religion turning or risking to turn into a means of social protest. So if I want, if I can say something to Indonesians and to Balinese now, you have a beautiful island. You have a beautiful country. But please, don't have uh, economic policies that do a bad job in the term of unity of the country. Perhaps it's my last word. Thank you. And of course, I can talk like that because of Jokowi. Saya berharap bahwa kebijakan pembangunan dilakukan sesuai dengan tradisi kebersamaan. Jangan kita main dengan hubungan antaragama di negeri ini. Ya, tadi jauh lebih rumit, tapi ya begitulah. Terima kasih. Uh, baik, terima kasih pada Bapak Jungkuto untuk penjelasannya. Uh, dan ada sudah ada dua presentasi tadi dari Michelle Picard dan Jungkuto. Michelle Picard berfokus pada konstruksi identitas di era kolonial sebelum Indonesia merdeka dengan paparan yang menarik mengenai pemahaman agama dan juga adat dan kemudian disambung oleh Bapak Jungkuto 
dengan menjelaskan bagaimana identitas agama dan adat itu berlaku di masa Orde Baru dan juga Orde Lama yang itu kemudian dikaitkan dengan bagaimana politik pembangunan ekonomi di Bali terjadi yang dikuasai oleh investor-investor asing. Jadi sebenarnya dua hal yang sangat kompleks. Kalau misalnya teman-teman punya pertanyaan, uh, sekarang kita akan buka sesi tanya jawab. So, uh, those are the presentation from Michel Picard and uh, Jean Couto to different periods about Bali, about the ident construction of Balinese identity. Uh, now we open a Q&A session for those who have questions for Michel Picard or for Jean Couto. So please, maybe you can raise your hand and then mention your name. Bagi yang ingin bertanya, maybe three person at the first session, for the first session. Tiga orang penanya utama. Kira-kira ada yang punya pertanyaan? Dipersilakan. Silakan satu, masnya. Mikrofonnya dari belakang ya. Uh, sebut nama, kampus atau pekerjaan, dan pertanyaannya ditujukan ke siapa? Terima kasih, selamat malam. Selamat, uh, terima kasih atas uh, waktunya. Nama uh, saya Ari Yuliana. Saya bertugas di SMK Negeri Satu dan Pasar, guru multimedia. Uh, pertanyaan ini saya tujukan ke Fis, uh, apa? Michelle Picard. Michelle Picard. Saya, saya cepat lupa, <laughs> maaf. Uh, saya sangat tertarik dengan apa yang dipresentasikan uh, tadi, cuman apa yang dibuat, apa yang dipaparkan tadi, itu yang saya rasakan sekarang. Saya sempat membuat film judulnya Lost Identity. Jadi uh, orang Bali itu memang dari dalam perut, lahir, itu semua ada prosesnya. Jadi itu bukan agama, itu adat. Seperti itu misalnya, ya, jadi ada perbedaan itu. Jadi pertanyaan saya, Uh, perkembangan era yang serba canggih sekarang ini kira-kira masih mampu nggak adat budaya itu dipertahankan menurut uh, pandangan Michelle terima kasih Uh, maaf karena uh, kemampuan bahasa Indonesia saya sangat jelek ya, jadi saya lebih uh, suka uh, berbahasa Inggris ya. If I understand your, your question, you might, you're asking me what I think about the way uh, Balinese culture is gonna tahan, betul ya? I would say that depending what you call Balinese culture. If it's, if it's what is being on display as a tourist destination, it's, it's really booming. Then, I mean, culture as a way of life, as a matter of values, it's, it evolves. So, honestly, I don't, I don't know. What I could say is that when the, the French consultants who were asked to design the, uh, what was it called, the, the master plan for the development of tourism in Bali back in uh, 1971. Okay, I met these people, they happened to be French like me, and they told me that initially there was no in, in the requirements that had been addressed to that team of experts that we're going to design the way tourism would be developed in Bali for several decades. None of them knew anything about Bali beforehand, and there wasn't, there wasn't any anthropologist or sociologist involved in the team. The, the aim was to develop international tourism in Bali in order for the Indonesian government to make money. 
was not about Bali being developed. It was about tourism being developed in Bali to bring uh, foreign currency into the Indonesian uh, financial system. Now, what struck me is that initially they were worried. I mean, there was one sociologist who, was, who happened to have been part of that team, and he told me that initially they were worried that Balinese culture, and they wrote that in the, the master plan. I read the master plan, it's a huge thing. Back, uh, I mean, uh, in, at the, the master plan was designed uh, for until uh, 1985, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And they say by then, Balinese culture would probably have disappeared, but Bali would still attract tourists as a tropical Eden, as a tropical paradise. So in other words, they thought Balinese culture would be dead because of tourism, but Balinese natural environment would still be attractive to tourists. I think it's more or less the reverse that we uh, have uh, seen. I mean, Balinese culture, if you talk about producing works of arts or artifacts or music or dance or ceremonies, it's thriving thanks in at least in part, uh, to the money brought into Bali by tourism. On the other hand, the natural environment has been heavily damaged, and it's still being damaged by the day. Mungkin saya terjemahkan sedikit untuk teman-teman. Jadi jawaban dari Michelle Picard untuk pertanyaan Pak Ade tadi adalah uh, tergantung bagaimana kita mendefinisikan soal kebudayaan Bali itu sendiri, adat atau agama itu sendiri. E, karena misalnya di dalam master plan yang dirancang oleh seorang Prancis tahun 71, pemerintah Indonesia meminta para orang asing ini untuk merancang sebuah target master plan pariwisata yang tujuannya adalah untuk kepentingan pemerintah Indonesia, untuk uang mereka sendiri, jadi bukan tentang Bali itu sendiri. gitu. Yang mana mereka khawatir pada saat itu bahwa setelah tahun 85 kebudayaan Bali akan hilang karena oleh oleh pariwisata itu sendiri. Namun sekarang kita lihat semuanya masih bertahan di, di satu sisi itu berkat pariwisata dalam tanda kutip. E, namun di satu sisi kita bisa melihat e, kehancuran alam yang terjadi di Bali. Jadi tergantung bagaimana kita mendefinisikan. Ya, kalau saya mau nambah sesuatu ya. Kalau kita merasakan itu uh, Barinez uh, Artinya budaya Bali, ya. memori budaya Bali. Itu memori budaya Bali, itu sebentar lagi itu saya akan bicarakan itu di Nusa Dua. Ya. Yang terjadi, unsur yang dianggap asli diekstrak, diambil dari lingkungannya. Kemudian di fermak itu, dijadikan paket dan dijual pada pariwisata ya. Udah jelas, itu berarti dengan berlalunya waktu kita menyaksikan satu ya penyusutan dari memori asli yang jadi masalah ialah bahwa sampai sekarang ini belum ada upaya untuk merekam pakem untuk mewawancara dan uh, merekord itu apa yang dikatakan oleh orang tua gitu itu. Itu, uh, tapi uh, ya memori lama memang akan surut ya. Oke, okay, uh, ya satu penanya lagi mungkin dari teman-teman untuk Bapak Michel Pika atau Bapak Jong Kuto dipersilakan. Oke, okay, uh, Mbaknya yang pakai baju bobol di belakang. Pertanyaan saya, pertama, apakah di negara Prancis mengetahui tentang Bali yang memiliki adat istiadat yang berbeda untuk um, har, uh, untuk modern saat ini? Kedua, bagaimana bisa kita menghargai atau menghormati adat tradisi kita, bahkan agama kita, sedangkan kita terlalu banyak untuk mengadopsi uh, adat budaya luar negeri? Ketiga, bagaimana cara kita sebagai anak bunda mempelajari adat istiadat di Bali sedangkan kita sering mengubah gaya hidup secara bertahap, seperti luar negeri? Keempat, 
dari yang tadi dipaparkan to tentang tolak reklamasi, kita kan sudah mengajukan uh, ke tentang perpres tahun 2014 kalau nggak salah tentang penolakannya. Tetapi apakah pihak luar negeri khususnya Prancis uh, uh, mendukung kami dari Bali untuk menolak itu untuk tidak merusak alam seterusnya. Sekian dan terima kasih. Uh, I think you you expect far too much from the uh, the tourist and apparently the French tourist. I mean I'm not I'm not I'm not a representative of French uh, tourism. But you have to understand that much tourists, more, most of the tourists who come to Bali know close to nothing about Bali. At the, at the most, they've read what's in the, the guidebooks, and the guidebooks keep repeating more or less the same thing over the decades. So about, let's say, Reclamacy uh, Toluk Benoa, there were one or two articles in, in uh, French newspapers about it. But it's just part of the world news. I mean, it, it concerns a tiny minority of people, of French tourists who might have come to Bali, but they haven't heard of the Tolak Reclamacy Tolak Benoit movement. I mean, Jean Couteau and I, I wrote a, an article in a, in a specialized uh, journal of Indonesian studies about the, the Tolak Reclamacy uh, movement. But this is not a well-known uh, fact among the, among the tourists. So as far as what, if I understood your point, because you spoke far too f fast for, for me to really get all your, and, and then you asked, four questions, so I had to try to memorize everything, which is difficult. Uh, I have a problem with all these words, tradition, religion, culture. For me, the way I use them is by trying to understand the way they're being used by Balinese intellectuals using Indonesian. Agama, Adat, Budaya. Other than that, I mean, honestly, I don't know what is religion, I don't know what is tradition, I don't know what is culture. I'm not playing with words. These are, it's, it's, there are topics of discourse rather than realities. I mean, the people have their own life, they do what they, they do as Balinese. I'm not Balinese, I'm not, I don't have to tell Balinese the way they should be uh, doing. And at some point, for some reasons, some Balinese had to decide that what they were doing were, was either religion, agama, or adat. And as I try to explain in a, in a few words in my paper, these questions were very difficult to solve because they were not initially, they were not Balinese questions, they were, they were alien questions using foreign terms, as I said, agama, adat, budaya, are not Balinese terms. So these people, the first generations, generation of Balinese educated in colonial schools, were faced with the fact that they had to reply to foreigners, asking them what it meant to be Balinese, by using foreign terms and trying to make sense of them which is a very tricky uh, question. So I'm aware I'm, I didn't really reply to, the, to your question, but I, I tried to formulate it in, in another way that would at least make more sense to me. Uh, mungkin saya terjemahin sedikit jawabannya tadi. Jadi tadi pertanyaannya, menurut Michelle Picard, Uh, mungkin mbaknya terlalu berekspektasi tinggi pada turis bahwa turis memiliki banyak pengetahuan soal Bali dan pada kenyataannya kita, mereka sebagai turis sebagaimana turis pada umumnya melihat Bali melalui buklet pariwisata gitu. tidak banyak yang mereka ketahui misalnya tentang gerakan Bali tolak reklamasi jadi gerakan ini tidak sebegitu terkenal di luar negeri dan Michelle Picard juga Bapak Jung Kuto pernah menulis soal gerakan ini di sebuah artikel tentang Indonesian Studies. 
Uh, dan kemudian un- menanggapi pertanyaan lainnya, sebenarnya Bapak Michel Pikar merasa tidak punya kapasitas yang cukup untuk menjawab soal bagaimana mempertahankan kebudayaan dan lain sebagainya. Karena apa yang dipaparkan tadi semata-mata adalah menganalisis ulang soal pembacaan dari generasi pertama intelektual Bali yang mencoba untuk mendefinisikan siapa diri mereka melalui terma, agama, adat, budaya, di mana ketiga diksi ini adalah diksi yang masih asing ketika itu. gitu Karena itu adalah diksi dari bahasa Melayu, serapan. Yang di bahasa Bali tidak ada ketiga kata ini dahulu. gitu Bagaimana mereka menjelaskan diri mereka menggunakan ungkapan dari bahasa asing. Jadi ada semacam konflik identitas yang mereka alami ketika itu. Seperti itu. Uh, mungkin itu yang bisa dijawab oleh Bapak Michel Pekat dan beliau mohon maaf karena mungkin jawabannya tidak bisa memberikan jawaban yang sepenuhnya dari pertanyaan tadi. Oke, okay. uh, ada pertanyaan lagi? Uh, tadi Safitri nanya ya, silakan. Um, okay. Hi, I am Safitri. Um, I'm a freelance worker really in the arts. Um, I have I've been reading yourself a lot uh, the past years, and um, I, I'm as a Balinese myself. I have the same kind of questions. When I found your your reading, I mean your writings, it really helped, like understanding. Oh, actually, uh, there has been problematic terms. Like these terms are kind of problematic you know, from the first, and it affected the tourism, the mass tourism that happens in Yen. Um, maybe from the this presentation, both of your presentations, I feel like it's kind of repetitive for me, but it's a good thing that it, it reminded me again that um, I was wondering what would be your uh, like point of views on Mount Agong. We know that it's been uh, erupting, I mean, it's still active and erupting, but I don't know how it is in France, how it's seen these, uh, the terms that happened in 2017 and how it affected till now. And I was wondering, what do you think about the views that's been going on? Because uh, people, I uh, mean, the government or the people are still encouraging that tourists should come, that Bali is safe at the time when the eruption really happened. And it's as if like there is this, um, there is this uh, encouragement that Bali is safe, that it's okay that the, the volcano is erupting, but actually it's quite dangerous. It's a dangerous time. So, what is your point of view on that, as someone who's analyzing the tourism in Bali? That's it. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, in, in, in the French media, there has been some mention of the uh, Gunung Agung and the, the occasional eruptions. Uh, as far as I know, there was no um, travel warnings against trying to prevent French tourists to come to Bali because of that. But other than that, it was, I mean, Bali is famous the world over, you well know that, and so it's famous in France as well, more famous than Indonesia, and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, it wasn't really a topic to be uh, discussed. I mean, the French have other problems uh, to discuss in the media than uh, the, the, the condition of the, of the Gunung Agung, right? Uh, what I notice is that the way the, the Balinese authorities have tried to, uh, to minor the reality of the eruption and the way they, they dealt with the evacuation, they, they, were, they seemed to have been more preoccupied with the, the negative news uh, of the eruption for, for uh, international tourism than they were really preoccupied with the, 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 the lot, the condition of Balinese living near the Gunung Agung. And as far as I could read in various media, social media, the way they, they, de- the way they dealt with the condition and the evacuation was not very well uh, organized, was not very efficient. And they, they, I had the feeling that they, they were, yeah, they, they were worried about the, the t- tourists not coming to Bali because of that, rather than with how to really help 
the Balinese, particularly the ones living near, near the, the, the Gunagung. But, but again, I mean, um, I live in France. I come to Bali once a year for one month or six weeks. So I don't really, unlike Jean Couteau, who lives in, who lives in Bali and lived on Bali for many decades, I, I, don't, I don't live here. So I, my, my view of Bali is very much uh, from afar and from what I read about Bali rather than what I experience about Bali, except for a short period of time when I'm here on the island. Oke, okay, mungkin saya terjemahin dikit tadi ada pertanyaan soal bagaimanakah pendapat Michelle Picard mengenai veno, soal situasi erupsi Gunung Agung pada tahun 2017 kemarin di mana pemerintah uh, mencoba untuk memastikan pada part, turis bahwa semuanya baik-baik aja gitu. Sementara di satu sisi ada proses evakuasi yang cukup ada situasi yang cukup apa ya? gawat gitu di sekitar Gunung Agung dan Michel Picard menjawab di media Perancis sendiri tidak ada satupun berita soal travel warning yang melarang turis Perancis untuk datang ke Indon ke Bali pada waktu itu uh, namun saya tidak bisa memberikan jawaban Michel Picard tidak bisa memberikan jawaban yang sangat pasti karena beliau tidak tinggal di Bali pada waktu itu tidak seperti Jean Couto yang tinggal di Bali jadi perspektifnya adalah perspektif yang melihat Bali dari jauh namun dari pandangan Michel Picard Uh, ketika itu otoritas Bali atau Indonesia pada umumnya lebih sibuk untuk uh, meyakinkan para turis, meyakinkan dunia internasional bahwa Bali baik-baik saja dan mereka seperti takut kehilangan angka kunjungan dari turis-turis untuk ke Bali dibandingkan sibuk untuk mengurus proses evakuasi dari warga yang tinggal di sekitar uh, daerah Gunung Agung. Oke, okay, uh, ada lagi mungkin teman-teman yang bertanya tadi. Wow, tadi masih yang belakang tuh duluan. Sabar ya, Mbak. Ya, terima kasih untuk kesempatannya. Nama saya Wayan Pradnya Waisnawa dari Udayana. Okay. Saya ingin menanggapi beberapa hal terkait apa yang tadi dipresentasikan. Terutamanya tentang reaksi masyarakat Bali tentang adanya perubahan. Contohnya, turisme, turis-turis yang datang ke Bali dan membuat misalnya hotel atau merusak lingkungan atau apa namanya kebudayaan ada di setiap kita. Ya saya ingin menegaskan satu hal, perubahan itu selalu ada. Misalnya contoh, Bali Mula, Bali Ago itu sudah perbedaan. Bali Mula sebelum datangnya Majapahit, Bali Aga setelah Majapahit, gitu kalau nggak salah. Nah sekarang Bali modern, setelah datangnya pariwisata dan tamu dari luar negeri. Anggap ini perubahan zaman, itu pasti terjadi loh. Alias tidak bisa dihindarkan. Yang kedua, alasan kenapa kami dibilang tidak merespon tentang adanya perubahan atau tersebut, misalnya kehilangan budaya. Itu kebudaya atau hilangnya Uh, apa alam kami itu karena pertama satu hal nih kami tidak percaya pemerintah kami dalam beberapa segmen itu yang terjadi di tempat saya di gel gel satu orang pemerintah dia keluar keluar ini lahan hijau tidak boleh membangun di sini semua dibilang itu dikumpulkan kita di satu tempat dibilang ini daerah hijau tidak boleh ada yang membangun tapi apa yang terjadi itu semua mau kosong karena dia sendiri yang membangun di sana Sebetapa omong kosongnya hal itu. Oke. Okay. Ya. Kita bisa melihat hal ini perubahan itu selalu ada. Ya, seperti itu yang saya ingin tegaskan. Ya kira-kira kami selalu peduli dengan budaya kami. Kami melaksanakannya dari dalam hati dan dari luar juga. Tapi kira-kira bagi kami apa yang bisa kami perbuat secara lebih khusus, lebih mendalam? tentang bagaimana cara menyelamatkan Bali ini dari pengaruh yang agar tidak terle begitu kelewatan lah bahkan sampai rusak terima kasih I'm I'm not sure I understood if there was any question 
it was more a comment than a, so I don't, don't see what I could uh, reply. I don't know. You, do, you shouldn't expect uh, foreigners who've been uh, studying some aspects of Bali to bring, uh, to give you answers to your, to your political, social, economic problems. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, a, an expert in the sense of the, the, the people who designed the master plan. I'm interest, I've been interested in Bali, trying to understand a few, a few things, and I've worked on uh, from a anthropological and historical point of view and my my work has been to try to understand the evolution of some aspects of what Balinese intellectuals have written about Bali, about themselves, about the changes of times but I don't know what to say about uh, the future of Bali except that it, it's how could I put it? In many ways, it's a bit frightening. I mean, I lived in Bali back in the 1970s, right? I haven't been in Bali, I haven't lived in Bali since then. And then, Bali was very different in many ways. There were a few hundred thousand tourists a year instead of 14 million. So, I don't know. You should you should deal with the uh, with your government. You should deal with the your Chandikya one. Uh, don't expect uh, foreign academics to tell you what to do. Terima kasih. Jadi ada satu poin yang harus kita pegang teguh tadi adalah jangan pernah berharap pada orang asing untuk memberitahu apa yang harus kita lakukan untuk menyelamatkan Bali. Saya pikir itu poin yang harus kita pegang dari sekarang. Jadi kalau ada Orang Asia yang isi forum, saya pikir itu pertanyaan yang perlu kita hindari. <laughs> Oke, tadi mbaknya ada yang tanya, silakan. Uh, bonjour, my Juma Pel Sania, and I have a comment and a question for you. The comment is, I feel bad that apparently it still seems some of the Indonesians expect something from the foreigners, like and answers, a direct one. And okay, and that's it, the comment. And my question is, based on your perspective as a social scientist and studying Bali, who do you call us Baliness, um, Baliness nowadays? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's say the people who speak Balinese and we were born in Bali, now it's debatable uh, whether the Balinese, the real Balinese are the Hindu Balinese. Back in 1920, when the Dutch had the first census, there were about 98% of so-called Hindu Balinese, or not, plus. And now they're about 80% 80, 80 more or less. So I don't know if you, if you would include in, in the in Bali, the Balinese were not officially Hindu, meaning mostly uh, uh, Bali Islam or Bali Christian. It's up to you. I mean, for me, the Balinese are the, the people I, I see when I visit Bali, and we live, in, we live on Bali, we were born on Bali and speak Balinese, but also the Balinese were spread in a, all over Indonesia. It's not for me to decide who is a real Balinese and who is not. Okay. Gak usah diterjemahin ya. <laughs> Oke, okay, silakan Bapak. Pertanyaan berikutnya. Oh, mikrofonnya. <coughs> Terima kasih. Nama saya Nyoman Wijaya. Saya appreciate sekali dengan Michelle, saya punya bukunya satu. Nah, dari bukunya itu kita bisa melihat bahwa titelnya aja udah menyebutkan uh, apa, um, budaya pariwisata dan 
Ya, yang pertama adalah pariwisata budaya menjadi budaya pariwisata. Dari situ kita melihat dari pengalaman hidup saya, saya lahir di Bali 20 tahun yang lalu. Jadi sampai umur 20, umur 19 saya ke Eropa. Nah itu persis pada saat itu Indonesia Orde Baru. 50 tahun saya tinggalkan Bali, saya lihat Bali lagi 180 derajat berubah. Rupanya kalau saya tanya keluarga saya sendiri, mereka nggak merasa ada perubahan. Karena tiap hari di sini sedikit, 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 tidak ada. Jadi waktu kita masih kecil, jadi kalau kita berjalan di desa maupun dimanapun, selalu di wantilan itu selalu ada suara gamelan. Saya kembali, sepi. Dan anak-anak muda yang sekarang perginya bukannya ke wantilan, belajar gamelan atau apa, menari masih belajar karena mungkin te, diwajibkan atau saya kurang tahu. Kan, ini. Uh, tapi dari budaya yang dilakukan, dari, dari uh, adat yang, yang dilakukan ini, orang Bali ini tidak bisa komersialisasi, dari, tidak bisa hidup dari itu. Dan saya tahu bahwa semua bisa menari, tapi tidak bisa membuat uang dari situ. Berbeda dengan pada saat kita dulu, waktu kecil, itu selalu ada penari panutannya. Artinya di polok ada siapa, ada starsnya gitu. Sekarang saya juga tidak melihat siapa sih jagonya pendet atau apa yang terkenal di luar negeri. Jadi semua bisa, seperti kita bisa cuci piring atau apa, semua bisa menari kan. Jadi kalau saya lihat juga dari tadi uh, Jane juga sangat bagus memandangnya itu. Persis seperti kalau saya melihatnya Bali berubahnya persis seperti itu. Itu adalah terjadi uh, ketika di Bali zaman dulu belum ada tahun 60-an, sampai tahun 60-an belum ada turis, praktis itu belum ada turis. Ada turis yang datang ke Bali karena budaya, bukan karena karena berwisata, jadi perbedaannya adalah yang datang ke sini untuk melihat Bali seperti Balinya, tapi bukan mencari pantai. Yang belakangan yang datang ke sini, datang ke sini karena mereknya Bali untuk selfie, buang sampah, pergi lagi. Itu yang sekarang terjadi dan semua dari, dari sisi media juga ditulis pariwisata itu menjadi ketergantungan buat orang Bali, padahal Orang Bali sampai tahun 60-an itu Pulau Bali ini adalah mandiri. Jadi beras tidak tidak hampir tidak pernah diimpor bahkan mengekspor beras. Daging berkecukupan. Dan orang Bali sempat membuat patung tanpa menjual patungnya. Itu sebelum sebelum Orde Baru. Jadi sebenarnya dari sisi yang tadi sebutkan agama apa agama adat dan budaya dari situ saya eh, sekolah sampai kelas 5 baru ada pelajaran agama kelas 5 baru ada karena kurikulum dari Jakarta menyebutkan harus ada agama jadi kalau untuk agama yang lain Kristen atau Islam itu ada kurikulumnya untuk agama Bali nggak ada Silabusnya nggak ada, jadi di dalam pelajaran agama kita didatangkan pemangku-pemangku, kita diajarkan apa yang pemangku itu dilakukan. Tapi sekarang sudah lebih baik karena sekarang sudah sebetulnya agak dari sisi adat dan agama lebih kuat sekarang. Ininya lebih kuat, cuman dari sisi budaya yang yang menyebabkan Bali ini. Uh, boleh katakan mundur gitu. Jadi saya tidak yakin bahwa Bali ini akan budaya adanya adatnya akan hilang. Bukan karena turis, bukan karena apa, karena karena memang kita di Bali ini meyakini itu dan kita juga bersedia untuk berkorban untuk itu. Sebab orang di Bali ini lebih berat hidupnya daripada orang yang di, tidak menjalankan uh, adat Bali, sebab kita melihatnya beda. Jadi kalau uh, ada yang ikut di dalam keluarga membantu di kita, itu seolah-olah bagian dari keluarga. Beda dengan 
kalau pembantu yang dari kita tahu dari Bali ke Jakarta dan gimana sehingga orang di Bali ini yang yang itu selalu, selalu mendatangkan dari Jawa pembantu dia datang dari Jawa jadi orang Bali sendiri tidak akan ingin menjadi pembantu seperti yang uh, konotasi yang dari Jawa dan <tuh> yang lain mengenai uh, musuh hidup nah itu itu masalah istilah kalau saya kalau orang yang disebut bagus itu kan merasa dirinya di konservasi padahal tidak e, dari sepateknya museum itu itu yang menyelamatkan Bali artinya kita melakukan semua apa ada di Bali dan seterusnya itu seperti museum tapi di dinamik kemudian berikut semua perubahannya nah itu yang menyebabkan kita apa bisa survive karena Museum Hidup ini sekarang akhirnya dijadikan sebagai background untuk orang turisnya ini selfie atau jadi ya, pada prinsipnya itu aja. Terima kasih. Terima kasih untuk Bapak. Oke teman-teman, terima kasih atas kehadirannya pada sore hari ini datang dan mendengarkan diskusi dari Museum Hidup dan juga dari Museum Hidup soal konstruksi orang Bali di era kolonial temporer uh, satu diskusi yang sangat hangat dan kaya sekali tapi sayangnya kita sudah kehabisan waktu cuma sampai jam 6 sore karena setelah ini kita ada acara jadi untuk teman-teman yang ingin menikmati malam bersama malam Jumat malam bersama-sama di sini kita ada pertunjukan setelah ini ada pembacaan puisi pemutaran film pendek adaptasi dari puisi-puisi Apollinaire kemudian ada live musik DJ dari sound sekerta semua acara gratis, ada kuda panggung, ada asli kuda Jadi silakan bergabung di luar setelah acara ini berakhir uh, So everyone, uh, because the time is up So I would like to thank you all of you for coming to this discussion This is very rich and intimate discussion with you Michelle Bicard and Jean Couto uh, After this discussion, as we have a party outside Like with several performances uh, Poetry reading and then also We have film screening and at the end we have uh, live music from DJ Sansimaka so please enjoy and have some coffee or tea outside and I would like to thank you Michelle Picard for coming and sharing with us Terima kasih kepada Bapak Michelle Picard sudah berbagi dan terima kasih kepada teman-teman yang sudah bertanya Oh ya nanti teman-teman yang bertanya kita ada goodie bag tapi mungkin kita akan beri yang kedua ada sedikit sesuatu yang tidak ada Oke terima kasih semuanya selamat sore dan sampai berjumpa lagi di acara berjalan-berjalan